Okay, everyone. Uh, thanks for signing on. Um, looks like we are now streaming live. And um, let me close down this real quick. Um, so today what we'd like to do is um, demonstrate the selective area channeling pattern collection on the Helios L-Star column. Um, been setting it up a little bit before we started, but there's still some more work to do. Um, so we're going to walk through how we use our iFast script um, and to enter and exit SACP mode, how to calibrate that, and also just how we build the dependencies um, on their own. So if you have questions, you can utilize the chat feature. Uh, let me put something in there. And I should be able to see those as we're um, running the microscope. So, okay. Um, let me get back to where I was. So hopefully you guys can see my Helios screen here. And what we've got right now is a number of, let me go ahead and change the current so we can see. Uh, got a number of silicon wafers inside, and uh, these are single crystals because they're kind of the easiest to uh, get a pattern on. Um, this is a Everhart Thornley image, so standard secondary electron. Um, we will use the uh, backscatter detector for the SACP collection, what you can see right here. Um, so let me pause that again couple uh, pieces of software that you'll see. We have our iFast runner, which has the scripts for entering and exiting SACP mode. Uh, but when I go to build the voltage dependencies, I'm going to use the octopole regulators and the optics regulators. Where's that one? Nope. No, maybe it's behind here. That's octopole and optics not sure where that one went there they are okay um, so if you've ever used the uh, thermo or FEI TEMs and free lens control that's effectively what we're going to do to build these voltage dependencies so then our script can come in and out of selective area channeling pattern um, my electron beam is at 30 kV, and um, right now I'm just using a fairly high current, but the, high, the current will be set as we change our beam from a scanning condition to a rocking condition. Uh, sorry, I have to shift this window just a little bit. There we go. Okay. Um, let's go back here, sorry. So I've pre-saved some, um, some positions. We have three different silicon wafers. So unfortunately, and I've got a pretty noisy image here, let me slow that down. Um, those are just flat wafers, so there's not much interesting happening there, just a little bit of dirt on the sample. Uh, we also have a platinum aperture in the microscope and uh, we'll be able to use that possibly to um, determine exactly what beam current we have when we're in a rocking condition. Okay, um, it appears that is at 6.4 millimeter. Um, I need to bring the stage up to get that in focus at four millimeter. We've chosen four millimeter um, kind of arbitrarily just because that's where we're going to get the best backscatter signal. Um, you know, anyone with a Helios will know that four millimeter is just the eucentric point. Uh, for SACP, there's no reason you need to be at 30 kV. There's no reason you need to be at four millimeter. Uh, just so happens these are the beam conditions that we've, um, we've found. Oh, sorry. This is four point five. Okay. 
I just want to get this to four millimeters. And actually, what I need to be doing. I don't want to link. Normally, I would just link, focus, link, and then move, type in the Z. But uh, the platinum aperture is a little bit different height than my uh, silicon wafer. So 4.6. Um, so we want to go 0.6. So let's say 2.2. And smart idea would be to watch here. We're pretty close to some things, but 400 microns should be OK. think that that's probably the max of our stage. Okay, it doesn't matter because if we go use the Faraday cup, we'll be able to get the whole beam into the Faraday cup anyway. Um, but let me update this. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move back to the silicon wafer one of them. I'm not sure which one this is. We have a, a 100011 and a 111 oriented uh, wafer in here. And our CBS detector is inserted. So I am going to activate that. And I'm going to go ahead and just click our uh, script. This was written by Alan Hunter on our staff. Um, and we'll try to enter SACP mode and honestly see what it looks like. I, I haven't looked at this for a while, so um, unfortunately, I put, oops, sorry, I put my face right over the brightness and contrast. Okay. So we still see the feature that was there in scanning mode, and I can start to see some uh, bands for SACP. So what this tells me is that uh, for our calibration script, some of the voltages need changed. Um, let's see. So I'm going to come to the octopole, sorry, the optics regulators. And because I'm in sort of a hybrid rocking and raster mode, what I've, what I've got going on is uh, I've maximized the UHR lens, and now I'm changing the HR lens. We're getting a compound lens effect. And what I want to go, what I want to see is this particle will, should, exit our field of view. Oh, it looks like it happened too fast. And then it will insert on the other side, indicating that we've gone through the rocking position. Okay. And now we can kind of see the bands there, but uh, we can do way better than that. Slow down the scan a little bit. looks like a pretty narrow angular range. Um, so let's uh, take a look at some of our optics regulators. So what I plan on doing here is uh, I'd like to just kind of show entering and exiting these uh, SACP modes. And then I'll, I'll start to build the patterns from scratch. So you can see exactly how I go through all of these uh, optics regulators. What I'm doing now, the deflection ACX and the deflection ACY on the quadrupole, um, this is effectively your gun tilt and shift. So what we've done is, um, I'll kind of walk through a little bit of it. Looks a little crazy if you're not used to looking at these. Um, so the octopole are these scanning scanning plates. AC means uh, you know a, a sine wave back and forth. DC is a beam shift. So this would be the amount of voltage we're applying to scan the beam. This is the amount of voltage we're applying to shift the beam. Uh, and we have an upper and lower AC because this is a double deflection scanning system. 
Um, so what we want to do with the scanning coils actually is nothing. Uh, so I have turned the magnification maximum. You can see here it says 3.5 million X. This number does not really matter. Uh, or I don't want to say it doesn't matter. This, this number is not accurate. It means nothing. Um, so we've turned the C2 lens off. C2 is the standard lens that um, sets your beam current. We have a fixed amount of emission, and then the C2, depending on what our excitation is, uh, will set the beam current. Uh, but we've turned that off. And let's see if I can make this a little higher. C1 is the lens that we are focusing with. So C1 is all the way up in the FEG module. So we've got a working distance, probably about half a meter. Um, so we're focusing up at the FEG module with an electrostatic lens. And that focusing is happening above our uh, scanning point, which are the beam tilt and shift. Using what were the objective lenses or focusing lenses, we now are using the objective lens uh, to bend the beam back to a rocking point. So we scan the beam off axis, enter the objective lens, and then that will um, bend the beam back to the rocking point. So we can see a pattern here. I'm wondering why. Uh, UHR lens is um, the high resolution lens. Scan this a little faster. I'm actually not looking at the patterns now. What I want to see is uh, this feature exit the field of view in the bottom left should re-enter in the top right. So that's an indication that we've gone through the pivot point. This is the same sort of behavior that you see in a TEM uh, when you focus through with your rocking ronky gram. Um, the contrast, decrease the brightness. The um, channeling patterns are very um, contingent on the surface being nice and clean. Um, so even just a little bit of hydrocarbon can dramatically reduce your ability to um, make a nice channeling pattern. Okay, um, so what I wanted to do here was actually oops, cancel that. Make a note of what that um, 827 amp turns is what we found on the uh, HR lens. So I'm going to make a quick note of that in my notebook here. And 16.8 is the deflection for X, and 15.2 is deflection for Y. Okay. Sorry, I have another keyboard over there that I have to roll off to use. Um, okay, so we c clearly can see our channeling pattern. Um, so effectively, what uh, an SACP is, is a type of ECP, which is an electron channeling pattern. Um, when you have a, a fixed crystal lattice and you're rocking the beam with respect to the lattice, uh, we get a modulation of the channeling strength. And that's what we're imaging here. So um, 
honestly, I'm not sure what this orientation wafer is. Um, let's go back. Maybe I'll go to some others and see if we get something that's a little more obvious. Um, so of course we have the option of making this full screen as well. Um, but I have so many other windows I'm using that, uh, for right now we'll put it up in the top right. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and I'm going to exit SACP mode and that is going to go back to, um, just regular SEM imaging. We have an auto contrast and brightness as part of our uh, script, but it's not necessary to do that. Okay, so here we are in just standard scanning mode. Uh, you might be able to see some contrast here because when we scan the beam at a low magnification, uh, we're also creating an electron channeling pattern because again, you're just changing the um, angle of incidence between the beam and a fixed crystal. Um, let's go back to ETB. Okay, so uh, when we, the first step when we use our scripts to create these SACPs is we have to run this calibration. Um, as long as you're in the ballpark, it's pretty close and you can use the IFAST script. Um, Anybody who's built scripts with IFAST or run IFAST regularly will know that it is not a, um, I guess what I'll say is it's not as responsive as you might like. This would be a million times better with a Python API. So I've already found what my C1 focus value will be, and I'm going to show you how I do that later. Uh, this is how our calibration script just has to run. Uh, we have a variable container and we need to update all of the variables. Uh, so C2 should be off. Let's make sure. So I choose that I want to edit C2, continue the next step of the script. Yeah, so the value will be zero. I'm finished with the C2 portion, so I say yes. Uh, HR lens was one that wasn't quite right. So HR focus value, I made a note that we want that to be 827, continue. And now you see as I change that, uh, the feature that was on screen there uh, has moved off screen. My video's um, mirrored, so my hand movements are not quite right. So uh, it moved off screen, meaning that we're now back at the um, focal value or the rocking point. So I'm going to stop with that. Uh, the AC, X, and Y, we had modified a little bit. So let's change those values. Um, X, we like 16.8. Uh, go back to the CBS detector, good point. Turn those brightness way down. And I'm going to move this off a little bit. So there we see the pattern. Okay. Uh, and unfortunately, one thing that's happened where you were a multi user facility, and, and I think our backscatter is a little off center. So we've got a little bit of a dark edge. Um, okay. And the other value we liked was 15.2. Continue. We're done changing those. So now we should see. Uh, let me, I'm going to just ignore the pattern for a second. I want to see the overall disk. And, and we're just kind of filling that uh, field of view here. Um, so let me go back through. So we're done changing quad X, quad Y. Quad X and quad Y is quadruple scanning X, quadruple scanning Y. Um, the quad DC, so remember I said AC is a scanning signal, DC is a beam shift. Uh, I'm, what that would do is move this disc left or right or up or down. It looks fine to me. Um, the UHR, we're going to leave at this um, 
predetermined value. We just always use that value. Oops. Input properties. Yes. Continue. And finally, okay, so we're finished editing all of this. So I'm going to continue, return the sim to normal. I do wanna, for right now, I'm gonna save these values as default. Um, so next time I run this script, that's where it will be. Uh, so now I can say exit SACP, and we're gonna go right back to normal imaging mode. Um, so, you know, the way a lot of these electron microscopes work is that uh, for every accelerating voltage and beam current, there's, there's a long lookup table, um, and it's kind of like an optics tree. So what we're going to do is we're going to kick some lenses out of that optics tree, change their values, and then when we exit SACP mode, we just tell the system, revert back to your lookup table. Um, okay, so this is... Clearly an awful image, that's okay. I don't really care at this point. Um, let me go to ETD mode. Basically, I just want you to see that, yes, we are doing regular SEM imaging. Uh, one byproduct of rocking the beam and being in SACP mode is that the stage movements don't work right uh, because they those are tied to the perceived magnification. So none of my arrow keys or clicking around will help. Uh, so usually I like to move around outside of SACP mode and then we enter SACP mode. Um, let me go to the next silicon wafer and if all goes well, we should be able to go to our CBS detector, enter SACP mode, set our contrast and brightness, and then see a pattern. We've talked in the past about pulling out this ACB routine, which we can do. Um, okay, so this wafer, there's some sort of pattern there. Um, honestly, I, I haven't put this sample in in quite a while. So really what I think, it's just kind of a dirty sample. Um, let's see, so what I do is, um, you know, I can type in values here if I want, I should be able to. So maybe let me move a millimeter in one direction. Um, unfortunately, that was way too far. That took me right off the sample. Um, minus 14. What I'm looking for, honestly, is an area of this um, of this wafer that probably doesn't have quite as bad hydrocarbons on it. Um, for so one thing you'll notice though is that as I'm moving the stage, um, the the patterns that we're seeing aren't changing, which we expect because the orientation, it's a single crystal orientation is the same everywhere. Um, okay. Come back to here. And last, uh, you know what, let me, let me go to the silicon. I'll go to the platinum aperture to see maybe if we get lucky there. And um, that should channel pretty brightly. So of course that sample was not at the right position. And um, what that means is that we're gonna have to change our uh, HR excitation. So the sample was farther down, which means that we need to relax the HR lens a little bit. The, the pivot point will be above the sample uh, because our silicon wafer was up here, now we're down here. So if we relax the beam, then we'll drop the pivot point down. So now we're doing mainly a rocking and scanning. Um, oh, 
the uh, one thing I did forget. So we're at a different working distance. So our um, C1 focus value, the the setting that focuses from the FEG lens all the way down, that's not going to be right. Um, so let's. What I want to do here, really quick, is is just um, let's see if I can drive over. Is this going to work? No. Nope. So see, the stage movements don't work if I try to use the joystick because it thinks I'm at a 3.5 million magnification. It's going to move nanometers. Um, so let's try 15. That was awful. Um, plot of aperture. So I'm going to drop this. Let's move. Uh, basically, I'm just now directly addressing the stage. Um, doing X movements. I just want to put the beam right in the middle of the, um, take a little detour here, put the beam in the middle of the Faraday cup to see uh, what sort of beam currents we have. Okay, that should be good enough. I think the beam is entirely uh, in there. And if I come back here. So the specimen current right now, um, and I'm gonna speed, let me just speed up scanning. Um, so we're around uh, 360 picoamps. Even though our beam setting says 100 picoamp, if you remember, um, what we've done is turned off the C2 lens. That that this is this value is a function of the C2 lens in normal lookup table settings. Uh, we've turned the C2 off. So now, and we've actually also retracted a an aperture. Uh, so this is the beam current. We're getting about 360 picoamps. Um, okay. So let's do this. Um, I'm going to exit SACP mode. And I'm going to go back to the silicon. I believe number three was the better wafer. I have to admit that my um, storage of these samples has not been perfect. Um, they're just kind of in a plastic uh, sample case. Okay. okay. Uh, so now what we're going to do is I'm going to build these um, SAPs, SACPs from scratch. Um, We can go to CBS, doesn't matter. Okay, so right now we're in just standard standard SEM, standard imaging conditions. Um, I, I would like to... Let me go back to the backscatter. Um, you know, I'm not spending a lot of time, honestly. Uh, This happens sometimes. The reduced raster window takes up more space. Uh, I'm not spending a ton of time really getting the um, beam settings perfect because it, for these demonstration purposes, doesn't really matter too much. So uh, I just wanted to, so I focused four millimeter, linked the stage position, and moved the sample up because uh, we had gone over to that platinum aperture. Okay, uh, so now we have a 30 kV beam and we are at four millimeter working distance. Let me unpause, minor change there. So we're at a four millimeter working distance, distance between the focusing lens, which in this case we're in mode one. So that's the UHR or HR lens, not the UHR lens. Um, that distance four millimeter. Um, so at this point, uh, and this is where we really started with SACP is we decided before we had the IFAST script, before we figured out how to 
pop in and out of the object model. Um, we built these manually, so I'm going to do that. And first step with that uh, is to, so we want to turn the C2 off. Uh, we want to uh, focus with C1. We're going to remove the aperture. Um, and of course, all of this is, um, so uh, Marty Krimp from Michigan State, Alan Hunter, myself, Shanub, uh, who I believe is at Max Planck now, um, have a paper that you can find, um, I believe it's in Alter Microscopy, that, that actually does lay out the full process. Um, but it's kind of hard sometimes to recreate these from papers. So uh, what we found is the easiest way, because of course I can come to the, um, not the octopole, sorry, the optics regulators, and I can set here C2 to zero. I can focus C1. This is not very responsive though. FEI or Thermo did not design this. More, this is more a display than, than a real um, control. Let me go back to 100 picoamp and that should revert. No, let me just go to a different one. 200 picoamp and now you see, see the lookup table reverted. We're back at 770. Um, if I turn, I'm turning now the focus knob on the MUI, and you see this excitation of the HR lens changing. Um, so that just shows, okay, this is this is the HR excitation. All right. So what we did is the first thing we need to do is turn C2 off, focus with C1, and uh, retract that aperture. The nice thing is, is this UC source current calibration. Uh, if you come over to your alignments tab. Uh, let me move my face out of the way, sorry. Um, if you come over to the alignments tab, of course we are logged in in the um, expanded access mode. Um, so talk to your thermo or FEI service engineer um, and you can get that password from them. Um, so there are a couple places to get it. I'm just going to this electron column UC alignments. This gives me everything, but I'm going to do the UC source current calibration. The reason why I do this is that it just, um, we noticed that it very conveniently, do I want to move the stage? No, nope. I want to keep the stage right where it is. I want to say next. And if now we look at the optics regulators, very conveniently it has turned C2 off uh, it's turned the HR lens off, and if you were in the room, you would have heard the apertures retract. Uh, so it takes care of all three of those set settings for us all at once. Um, so that's why I like using this. Uh, we're not going to use it in the standard mode, though. Uh, I ignore this. The first page here is just, hey, can you see something? Yeah, we see something. Okay. So I'm going to go to the next page, and there are a couple things I'm going to do. Um, first is we're gonna use the uh, C1 to focus. And just get it roughly in focus. You'll obviously see where, where you are. Uh, what you're looking at now, this medium gray area, is the backside of the backscatter detector. Uh, maybe what I'll do, because to find the appropriate C1 value, you don't, you don't need to be in CBS mode. Uh, CBS is only for actual collection of the patterns. Uh, so let's retract that. and go back, detectors, ETD. Okay, so now you see that medium gray value is gone, uh, area is gone. So what I've done is, and you can kind of see it, you know, when you use electron microscopes a lot, you can start to see stuff in the noise. So I'm looking at this little white particle here that now is lined up. There we go. So I'm just gonna drag this slider back and forth until we, and it's not going to be a perfect uh, value be, or perfect focus because again, remember, uh, we have almost a half a meter working distance. So, you know, I actually did this right before we started uh, streaming. 3195 is, is a good enough value. Uh, you can see 3190, it starts to get blurry. I go through the focal point, 3200, clearly it's blurry. 
Um, okay, so I'm happy with 3195. Um, and basically all you want to do at this point, you know, we write that number down so that we can um, put it into our um, calibration script, but we're doing it all manually. One other step I do here though, is you, what you're seeing here, the bright white is the uh, backside or the, the edge of the pull piece bore. So if I go into crossover mode in this alignment, I'm just doing a standard source tilt and shift. And let me bring up the um, optics regulators. And let me now, again, my face it just keeps following us around. Um, when I grab this UI source tilt and shift, what you're seeing change here are the DC values. So we're basically just pushing the beam around with the um, quadruples. And then, um, We do the same thing with the tilt. And so what I do in this step is I, and actually what I want to see is the background disk. Uh, I try to get the, the main image area centered on the edge of this, this pole bore, but I also want to get that using source tilt centered around the yellow cross. And there's a little component of shift every time you tilt. So it's sort of iterative. And now if I go out of crossover mode, um, you can see I, I'm not quite, maybe I can even get it a little better here in this view. So let's see. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward there. If I come back here, this tells me the optic axis is not perfectly aligned, but that's okay. Okay. Um, so the whole point of this step was just to find the C1 value and utilize the fact that this alignment will turn um, C2 off. It retracts the apertures, the, the electron beam, basically beam defining aperture, and um, then allows us to focus with C1. Maybe, maybe what I'll do is this. Um, There we go, oops. All right, so we're doing a manual set of manual creation. Uh, I'll drop the font because we usually use this to leave big messages on the screen. All right, 20. Manual SSCP creation. Uh, first step is C2 off to EBA, the electron beam apertures out. Uh, it effectively is a one millimeter aperture, so the aperture doesn't affect the beam at all. And three, um, focus with C1. Um, actually, I, sorry, I forgot to mention two. Uh, and we'll renumber those. HR, uh, let's call this, um, it is the HR lens, but objective lens off because if your obje objective lens is on you're not going to find an appropriate c1 value okay so what's nice is that um, the uc source current alignment and let's text wrap uh, actually let's drop our font a little bit Okay, um, and I'm gonna leave this here. So we still don't see a pattern though, and a couple reasons for that. Uh, one is that you see the mag says 70, so uh, we're, we're scanning with the octopole coils down here, not the quadrupole up top. Uh, so now I have a couple options. I'm gonna bring up the octopole regulators, and I could come to the deflection ACY for the lower octopole, just drag it to zero. And then I can come to the deflection ACY for the upper octopole, drag it to zero. And now I've effectively stopped scanning with the octopoles. Uh, the other thing I can do is just turn the mag knob way up. Um, 
Okay, so we still don't see a beam or a, a sorry a pattern. And the reason at this point is we have we're focusing with C1, but the beam is just static straight down the column because the octopoles aren't scanning and we've not yet set the quadrupoles to scan. So if I bring the quadrupole values up, and at this point, sorry, I will um, go back to CBS mode so we can start to see the pattern show up. Yes, insert the detector. Uh, optics regulators. Okay. So now, if I increase these AC values, <clears throat> something like 15, there. Okay, so we can see, let's see, this needs to be a little bit bigger. Uh, so when we really wanna be uh, quantitative about this, uh, one thing you can do is come to the uh, annotation and at, at what I'll do is draw a circle so we have a perfect circle and then I will um, change the scanning values so that we have a perfect circle there right now I just want to see something circular in nature let me start scanning slower and right now what we have happening we look back at the optics regulators. Uh, our HR lens is off. Our UHR lens is off. And of course C2 is off. We're focusing and we're scanning up at the gun, the gun um, eight quadrupole ACs. So we now have just a really ultra long working distance SEM image. And um, that's why we're seeing this ECP. This is not a rocking S um, ECP, this is, let me see, uh, this is a scanning ECP, electron channeling pattern. So we want to change that from a scanning ECP to a rocking ECP. Uh, I'm going to utilize, see if I can find it again. There was a nice feature for us. Um, I like to use, uh, you know, just debris on the surface. There we go. This is going to help us. Do a couple things. Okay, so we see some patterns, we see some features. Uh, clearly, we're just scanning the beam across a really large semi angle. So, our scanning angle is pretty large. That's why we're getting that SACP or ECP. Uh, first step is now what we need to do is as we're scanning, we want to at the edge enter an objective lens field that will then uh, pivot the beam back towards a uh, rocking point. So we're gonna take the UHR lens maximum. It's interesting. Uh, you can see some changes there. And now, as I start to bring up the HR lens, we've got some beam rotation. going to change these deflection AC values. And now whatever this particle is, uh, actually let me click through that a little slower. We fill the field of view with it. turn the contrast down. Uh, I'm going to actually scan a little faster because what, what I'm going to focus on now is this particle and not, um, not the channeling patterns. So I have, I have this particle. Um, he's a little lion with a tail and a head here. Is a little pause. The um, reason I, I mention that is what I want you guys to see is that as I go through the pivot point, it's going to invert um, 
And again, if you do a lot of TEM, you're used to this on the Ronke grams, but if you don't. Uh, so now we go through, losing a little bit of space here, go through the pivot point, and now he has inverted. So this feature was in the top left. Uh, these, these portions of the feature were in the bottom right, but we've gone through the pivot point. And what I want to do is now find basically the point, and you can kind of see it there. Here is the point that if this were a uh, true Ronke gram, the edge is what they call the uh, region of infinite azimuth magnification. Uh, we would have some stripes here, some radial stripes. That's the region of infinite radial magnification. Uh, basically just means that the beam is, uh, the rocking point is exactly on the sample surface. Um, we, we have some um, chromatic aberrations in the lenses. And so we have some, basically there's a, a small difference between the rocking point of um, say the two extremes of the, the aberrations. Uh, so that's why we can still see it. You know, honestly, I've looked at these quite a bit. Um, so we have a bright area here and a bright ring. Um, so I think we've got just two, our chromatic spread is rocking at two different points. Uh, okay, octopole, no, optics regulator. So 831 seems to be a decent point for what I would call the optimal rocking angle. Okay, and now if I were to move the stage uh, again, let me get my face out of the way, there we go. Um, Basically, I want to just move off that, off that feature. And are we in? No, we are in CBS mode. Make bigger movements. Verify ACs are all at zero. Verify VHR here. That's correct. Uh, now's a point that maybe I will. I'm going to shift this up a little bit. There we go. Um, Down. Oh, so we were just still on that particle when we move out of the way. We've got really small stage movements. Okay, get that particle out of the way. Head back up to 831. Oops, no, that's not what I want to do. Accidentally clicked the slow scan button. Um, now we need to turn our contrast up and our brightness down, and there our pattern is starting to come back out. Let's look at the video scope. Okay, so um, that basically is how we create a SAPC, SACP from scratch. Um, let's go back to our notepad. Um, let's say, right, must use the CBS detector for patterns. Oops.
So we turned our C2 off, we turned the objective lens off. With the electron beam aperture out, we then focused with C1. I'm gonna move this up. And after focusing with C1, we um, effectively turned off the scanning coils. So, which was done here in the octopole regulators. We turned the deflection AC to zero and in the upper and lower octopoles. Six, after turning off the octopoles, um, we use the quadrupole, which is traditionally the gun tilt and shift coils. Beam. Again. Sorry, word wrap. There we go. Um, and then at this point, what we wanted to do is create an objective lens field. So in our case, we use a compound lens effect with the UHR lens and the HR lens. Uh, set UHR field strength to max. And eight, we uh, found the, sometimes I call it the pivot point, uh, rocking point with uh, HR lens. Um, and at that point, we're now creating SACPs. Uh, if we had a polycrystal sample, we could um, move the beam in a matrix or move the stage in a matrix and, and capture patterns. Um, we can look here. Uh, we're at a 512 by 442. I can change the resolution. Of course, all I have to do, if I want to do that, Octopole regulators and no optics. Um, let me increase the scan right here. So I'm just filling filling this single field of view here. guys up, up we'll go down okay so we have a way of making a higher resolution SACP um, one thing I'm gonna do just as a demonstration um, I'm gonna come to the actually I don't want to do it in the optics regulators because it's not re very responsive uh, I'm gonna come back to this source current where I have a nice responsive uh, value for C1. Um, if we change the C1 value off of our, what we found to be, say, the focal point, what we should see, let me go up the other way, maybe that'll, maybe that'll do it. It's a little hard to tell because we're, we're dwelling pretty slow, but effectively um, the bands just become more indistinct. Uh, our the reason why we've, we want to focus so far away is that the convergence angle of the beam is very narrow. Uh, I haven't really calculated what the semi-angle is, but it's a very narrow, effectively parallel beam that then we're rocking back and forth. Um, so the effect of not being at an appropriate C1 value uh, is that the patterns just won't be as distinct. So if I come back now, we liked 3195. And now our patterns are much more distinct. And I apologize, my sample, I think, just has some hydrocarbons on it. So uh, normally you can create some really sharp patterns. Um, we also can increase the contrast quite a bit. And then turning the brightness down. Scan a little slower. Oops, a little slower. Not that slow. Okay. 
Um, so what I can do now really quickly, um, let's see. I'm going to, again, make note. So our values have changed here just a little bit. Um, so deflection AC 17.5 and Y is 15.2. Uh, no, 16.1, sorry. 15.2 old value. Okay. Um, so again, just, just to show one more time, I'm going to... I think, I'm pretty sure, let me now just close close this um, source current calibration. Uh, just cancel, because we don't want to make any changes that will change our uh, electron beam settings. Um, to exit SACP mode. There are ways to get back into normal imaging. You just have to revert everything back to the lookup table by changing the current and then maybe going in and out of crossover mode to reset your uh, gun, gun values. Um, okay. Close that window. Yeah, so Effectively, that's what I'm going to do now is just go to a different current value. Um, and if I, let me just verify. Oh, oops, I closed. Sorry, I got to reopen the optics. Um, so the optics regulators and the octopole regulators, test octopole regulator.exe, test regulators.exe. Um, again, you'll have to discuss with your thermo service guy about where those are that probably wouldn't be a good idea for me to sh show it on YouTube um, okay so these these didn't reset when I said exit SACP because I was in this weird hybrid manual mode but I can just come in and turn the crossover mode on you know and one thing that you can do is get used to okay what what happens when I go into crossover mode? If you look at these optics regulators, you really start to learn your electron column. So what that did uh, is it's scanning the electron beam uh, here with the deflection AC. Um, and if I go out of crossover mode, I expect these to go back to zero. And they did. So now effectively we've just utilized some functions on the Helios. Let me turn this off to get us back to a standard imaging condition. Okay, so there's that feature. Looks much less like a lion here. Um, so if we look at our calibrate SACP mode uh, script, Not terrible, maybe it is a little bit. Um, what I want to do is um, come here, and I needed to. I need to move the stage a little bit because I keep forgetting I'm on that particle, uh, off of that particle. So our our default calibration values weren't weren't too bad. Uh, but we made some small changes. Um, so let's say, well, what were these quad values? True, continue, 16.8, 15.2. Um, so it's, it's pretty good. I'm gonna just continue. I am finished there. True, continue. Um, finished editing, yes. No, I'm going to leave where we are. Okay. So I can now exit SACP mode. So it will, when I exit SACP, it just goes, reverts back to the object model. 
uh, goes back to standard imaging. Uh, when I enter SACP mode, um, it's going to use those values that we calibrated. And we should get rid of the auto contrast and brightness. Um, okay, so let me scan fast. So, you know, what we can do, you can go, let's try again over with this other silicon wafer. Um, you know, actually I've got, um, DTB mode. I've got a, um, Line the crossover. We've got a pretty low signal image there. Yeah, I would expect a little more from focus first before mode change. Um, meaning uh, SACP mode change, Alan. want to get to this little particle and focus the image here. Uh, I've got another sample in. Um, oh yeah, looking distance should be four for each wafer. Um, something weird did happen. Uh, let me just go back to quad mode. Um, it's kind of playing around with the system at the last minute and I put it in a weird, weird configuration. What I'm looking for is just something on the surface to focus on. It's a wafer, pretty flat. Here's the edge. Okay. So one of the um, most, I guess, important uses of all right, 4 so we're pretty close, of um, SACP is for ECI. I'm not really going to show ECI. I don't have any samples with, um, say, dislocations in them that would look nice. Um, but what SACP mode lets you do is determine the crystal direction without having to use something like EBSD and then you can do some true um, dislocation imaging. True meaning, of course, you can always just tilt the stage and try to find a um, highly channeling condition. Uh, but with SACP, you know the true crystal directions and um, you can do uh, satisfy some of the, the G.B requirements because uh, effectively, right, where your dislocation lines up with the crystal direction, it's not going to give any channeling contrast. It's the g dot b equals zero. Um, so what we can do is take, say, two images or four images at different crystal directions and um, do more than just, say, imaging of dislocations. Okay, so we are at four. Blank four. Great. Copy. Okay, so let's see what this wafer, how it looks. I should be able to go to CBS mode and just enter SACP mode. Let's just stop that. It's con or brightness way down, so like high contrast.
So honestly, I, I didn't, I should have probably plasma cleaned these samples and cleaned them again before putting them in. Um, Cause we're used to seeing much better patterns from these guys. So it looks like we have a bright uh, zone axis out here. Just taking a quick look. I'm kind of unsure what that orientation is. Um, or maybe this is the zone axis here. Uh, what I can do now uh, just really quick. Um, actually, let me do this. Mm. Oh, never mind. I was thinking about showing the uh, the iFast script, but I think what I would probably be better to do is if you guys are interested in that, um, we can just share it, blast the surface. Um, that is true. I can try to clean up the surface pretty quick. Um, so let me pull the CBS out. Go back to ETD. Okay. Uh, oops, shouldn't have closed those guys. Source tilt back. Actually, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to go to a different sample. This is a pretty low signal image right now. So um, I'm gonna try something. Um, oh, I'm at too high of a voltage anyway. Um, I'm gonna change the voltage. I'm gonna go into UHR mode and then back out of UHR mode to see if uh, maybe something with the UHR lens got stuck in the object model. Because I normally, we at 1.6 nanoamp, we should have way more current or way more signal than we're seeing. Okay, back to field free mode. Now back up to 30 kV. Let me go over real quick to the TLD detector. I think, honestly, I think the problem lies right now in our ETD detector. Um, we've been having some service issues, um, you know, as everybody does. Um, but it seems like the ETD isn't giving us quite the signal we'd like. Let me go over to the ice detector, which is an in-column secondary electron detector. Oh, sorry, I said in-column, I meant in-chamber. Okay. Now, this is also a uh, silicon wafer and Beam is really astigmatic. Oops. Oh no, I 
I guess I am looking at mode one. This is a the Pelco 10 micron uh, alignment sample. Uh, so it should be a silicon wafer. Um, let me link that stage position and we're gonna come up to 4.0. Probably should have done that with the, there we go. Um, at times we lose signal in our ETD and um, it can help to put the system into standby and come back out. Uh, but right now, just wanna see what happens if we try to create an SACP here. So let's insert the CBS detector. CBS is just concentric backscatter. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you see we have much more signal with the backscatter detector than secondary electron detector, and that's just not normal. So I just want to verify we're at four millimeter because that's where we set our um, rocking point. So one more time, I'm going to link three point. All right, so we were 40 micron off, so that's fine. Now, fingers crossed, we should be able to just come here to enter SACP mode and see a pattern. stop the auto contrast and brightness and just do it myself brightness way down All right, so we see um, we can see some channeling patterns. I, I honestly think this is a more narrow um, rocking angle than we're used to seeing. Um, chances are what I probably should have done is put our Helios into standby and brought it back up before trying this experiment. I think it's kind of like making it take a nap um, so it's less cranky. I know what's going on, uh, and I close those regulators, so let's reopen them. So you can see the, um, these are the Pelco focusing uh, measurement squares and we were just a little bit off of the optimal rocking point.
changing the polarity of the, the HR lens just to see if that um, does anything for us. Honestly, this doesn't quite look like I'm used to seeing, so. Um, I'm going to take the HR down to zero. switch the polarity again, go back the other direction. All right, so I can kind of see some patterns here. Just clicking up through um, the HR values. Um, so what I'm going to, what I would say is, I, I think I might need to think about this a little bit because I would expect um, what I expect to see is the rocking angle changing some. Um, you don't really see that too much. We have recently had some service on our system. I haven't looked at SACP since then. Um, so we might need to do some optimization. So it seems to be the same same HR value for the having the rocking point coincident with the sample. Um, okay, so um, for the manual steps, right, we just turn the C2 off, turn the objective lens off. Um, and I guess what I can say here, uh, Instead of found the rocking point with the HR lens, um, a, we first turn the HR lens back on. Okay. So we turn C2 off, objective lens off, the electron beam aperture out, and we focus with C1. Uh, this can all be done by IFAST. It can also be done with that alignment that we showed. Um, then at that point, we went to the scanning coils and turned those off, set their values to zero or maximum magnification. Uh, we use the quadrupoles to scan the beam. Um, these are your traditional gun tilt and shift coils uh, up near the FEG module. And that was accomplished by changing these deflection ACX and deflection ACY values. And that, that set basically the focus, um, the, the scanning range of the uh, image that we saw. Um, we turn the UHR field strength to max simply because we need a compound lens effect to get, get the full rocking, uh, basically to get the get the pivot point coincident with the sample surface. We need a very strong field strength. So we set the UHR field strength to max. We turn the HR lens back on and use that to build this compound lens and get the rocking point directly coincident with the sample surface. Um, so that's the gist of SACP creation on the Helios, um, what you'll need access to is um, either this script with the calibrate values. The calibrate script, um, you know, it, 
it works well. And once you have it set, once you've built your voltage dependencies and know what they are, you can then pop in and out of SACP mode. Um, with So this is effectively a collection of three scripts, one that enters SACP, one that exits, and then one that finds the voltage dependencies. Uh, manually, I, I personally find it a little faster to do it manually and then use the calibrate script just to populate the values I manually found. Um, we can share these scripts with you if you'd like. Uh, just reach out to uh, myself or Alan Hunter um, and we can get those to you. Uh, so at this point, I'm gonna sign off and if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, you can contact me. If you look at our facility website, mc2.engine.umich, uh, you can find my email address, Alan's email address, um, and or uh, mine's Kerns R K E R N S R at Umich, and uh, hopefully be able to answer any questions you have. Um, so thanks for signing on. Thanks for taking a look. And if you have any questions, please reach out.